Is it working? No. Hello, and welcome everyone to um, the Health Law Institute's uh, speaker series. This is our third talk this semester, and things are going quite well. Um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Kwame McKenzie, um, who has an extensive, uh, expansive array of achievements and credentials. Um, he is a physician and a full professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He's the CEO of the Wellesley Institute, um, which is a policy-generating entity in Ontario that focuses on research and policy to improve health equity, and I draw upon their work extensively. If you're not familiar with their work, I encourage you to take a look. Um, he's also a commissioner on the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, his work on the social causes of illness, the social determinants of health, and developing equitable health systems um, is absolutely groundbreaking, um, for which he has received numerous awards and recognitions, um, including being one of CIMH's 2017 Difference Makers in Mental Health and the 2018 Harold Jerome Trailblazer Award. Uh, um, today's format will be, as, as per usual, um, Dr. McKenzie will give us some formal remarks uh, for some 30 to 40 minutes, and then at close to one, um, we'll turn to discussion and questions, um, and then at about, when, when that uh, comes to a conclusion, I'll just give a few little remarks at the end about upcoming events, and now I'm going to turn um, you over to Dr. McKenzie. Welcome. Uh, so, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. Uh, every time I hear these introductions, I just feel tired. Um, uh, all, the, all the things that apparently I've done, but most of them are true, most of them. Um, so, uh, health I need to start off by thanking you all for making me feel welcome in, um, uh, in Halifax. It was, it was great that you were able to bring the rain and the fog and uh, all of the other things that us British people love. It feels just like home uh, being here. So thank you, thank you very much. And very much like Halifax in the UK, which apparently always has this weather all the time. Um, disclaimer to start off with. Um, these are my views. These are not the views of the Ontario government. Uh, there was an advisor for the Basic Income Project. It's not the views of the Ontario Basic Income Pilot Project or the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, these, are, these are my ideas, um, uh, so um, I, 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 need, I need to say that just in case um, I get anything wrong, um, which I will, uh, because this is a contentious area. When I say get it wrong, things that they wouldn't agree with necessarily. I want to talk about four things um, to try and cover the ground, but I'm really going to talk um, about this area in general so that we can get into a discussion and I can find out what you guys really want to know and we can get into a discussion about uh, what we know about this. Very quickly about what is a basic income. Uh, do we need a basic income in Canada? About the Ontario basic income pilot that I worked on and uh, then finishing to make sure we get a human voice in uh, some uh, lovely pictures by Jesse Gollum uh, which are the human to the basic income pilot, uh, which is a nice set of uh, pictures. Now, there is another, I want to give you a, a health warning uh, on this. Um, I am going to talk really quickly to cover the ground. If you try and keep up by writing things down, it will be bad for your health. <laughs> you, you will not keep up. Uh, this will all the, uh, the slides you can have, uh, they'll be on the Wellesley Institute site, they're here so that you can, they can be distributed and you can have the slides. Uh, but it would be really good if you are uh, engaged in the thinking part and then we can have a really good discussion at the end and you can pick uh, me up on things that I've got wrong. So, the basic income movement all around the world. Everybody's getting interested in the basic income uh, project. The green are... Uh, basic income uh, studies in progress, uh, the uh, pink is where they're planned, the mauve is where people think they're going to happen, they're high potential areas, uh, the uh, yellow orange is where there have been successful projects, uh, uh, and then there are other things like uh, cash transfers like there are in Alaska or dividends, and uh, 
luckily and uh, delightfully, uh, Ontario is in grey, uh, and uh, the, this uh, basic income site has put us down as UBI pilot prematurely cancelled. Uh, so at least we're good at something. Uh, the, the, the truth is we're not the only people, actually. Finland had theirs cancelled as well. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to say. When people are talking about, and I was really glad that uh, the title of this talk was about the guaranteed income, uh, because in Ontario we didn't actually do a basic income. A basic income, uh, by definition, is supposed to be an unconditional, non-means-tested payment which is above the poverty line. Okay, that's, that's the sort of standard, proper basic income. Uh, you can have a partial basic income, which again, unmeans tested, goes to the whole population below the uh, poverty line. Uh, but then there are lots of variants. And what we actually did in Ontario uh, was that we did a, a negative tax credit, um, which was another unconditional payment, but it was really geared towards uh, people who were poorer and people who were richer didn't get it. So it's not a sort of a classic basic income that goes to everybody. It was a really targeted approach uh, to people who are earning less than $34,000 uh, a year. Why? Why would we do this? I'm going to... Um, we're talking earlier about senators. And uh, Art Eggleton, as he left the Senate, Art Eggleton was the senator. Uh, he was the longest running, um, uh, running uh, mayor of Toronto, but also uh, was at the federal level and in the federal cabinet. And he, on leaving the Senate, um, uh, sort of uh, had, has just published his book, which is an e-book so anybody can get hold of. And I think I may have sent it so that people, so it's on the reading list for people who want to read. And he gives three reasons for the basic income in Canada. <coughs> One is poverty, second is inequality, and the third is changes in work. Just to get us all on the same page from poverty, uh, this is a um, sort of very straightforward graph that you can't read unless you've been to the opticians very recently, um, which just shows... Uh, the levels of poverty in a number of countries, 20, 30 countries, uh, who are sort of high to middle income. And in red, we've got Canada's uh, rate of poverty. Uh, the uh, higher you are on the list, obviously, the higher the level of poverty. And Canada, uh, though we're sort of a G8 country, um, we have quite high poverty levels. Um, we have higher poverty levels than Korea, uh, Italy, Australia, Portugal, Portugal, Poland, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Hungary, Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, um, Sweden, Slovenia, Ireland, and so it goes on. We've actually got relatively high uh, poverty. Um, and our child poverty is higher than our seniors' poverty. So we've got quite high poverty. Um, just to give you an idea for the room uh, about... Um, so if I stand here, you can't see, can you? Uh, you're having to look round me. So, but it's also on that, so for people who need to see around me. Um, Nova Scotia, about 17 and a half, 17.5 percent of the population is, is in poverty. Um, child poverty, very similar to uh, all the poverty levels for the whole of the population, uh, at about 17 percent, puts um, us here at about third or fourth highest poverty rates in uh, Canada. And people are interested in poverty because poverty is, um, increases the rate of crime. It, uh, high levels of poverty uh, are linked to poorer, developmental, uh, uh, in chil poorer development of children. Uh, economies actually struggle when there are high poverty rates. And so poverty is a drag, a significant drag uh, on the economy. Actually, it costs the Canadian economy um, about $38 billion a year, poverty. That's the cost of poverty. There are ethical considerations. Mm -hmm. And health. Poverty is linked to um, an, um, poorer health. Um, increased rates of uh, mental health problems, uh, physical health problems, um, 
health uh, use of uh, health services, uh, you name it, uh, poverty increases uh, the rate of health uh, problems. Uh, then there are legal, constitutional, um, and human rights uh, issues linked to poverty. Um, one of the things that people sometimes neglect is the political alienation that's linked to high, high rates of poverty uh, and uh, the psychological harm. And so just in general, poverty is a social cancer. Higher rates of poverty um, get almost everywhere in society and uh, tear it apart. So uh, if I were Donald Trump, I would say, poverty, bad. Okay. <laughs> Very simple. Okay. Sorry, if I were Donald Trump, really. <laughs> anyway. Sorry? I'm not sure I wished it. <laughs> it's just, it just, you know, when you're nervous and you're talking, these things come out. Anyway, inequality. Inequality is a growing problem in Canada. What you can see on this graph is the plotting of the Gini coefficient from 1975 to 2015. And the Gini coefficient is a measure of income inequality. A low Gini coefficient uh, means that there's less inequality. A high Gini coefficient, and the, the, it goes up to one, <coughs> means that there is greater inequality. And so it's a measure of income inequality. Uh, there's quite a lot of research that shows that the health impacts of inequality start to accrue after the Gini coefficient gets to about 0.3. So 0.3, and that's one of the reasons we're plotting 0.3 here. That's about your place. Uh, you want to be less than 0.3 if you want to have no health impacts of inequality. The blue line is the market income, the amount of money that people are earning. And the red is the, the income after taxes and transfers have been taken into uh, consideration. And so you can have a Gini coefficient that's based on after tax or before tax. And all this graph is showing is that between 1975 and 2015, um, there's been increased inequality, whether you look at it before tax or after tax. But the other thing that it shows is that up to about um, 1994, 1995, um, the tax impacts on inequality were much more significant. They were bullying, pulling the Gini coefficient down to underneath three. But from 1995 onwards, that tax buffering has been um, progressively taken away. And so in real terms, the Gini coefficient has been going up. Now, you have to take that with a pinch of salt. One of the things that has happened since 1995 is that um, the a reporting of income by the poor has stayed pretty much the same. And the reporting of the income by rich has, has changed significantly. Uh, the use of tax shelters and tax havens have increased, and so consequently, we actually have a much poorer idea of how much people are actually earning. And so at the, at the top levels, uh, some people are only really reporting about a third of their income. So uh, this Gini coefficient is a huge underestimate of income inequality at the moment because people are hiding money. And the richer you are, the better you are at hiding money. Changing nature of work is the other uh, argument for a basic income. Some people say it was great between 1945 and 1980. Uh, I'm not so sure, uh, really. I don't think it's ever been uh, uh, that great from a race relations perspective from 1945 to 1980. Uh, but it was uh, from uh, a worker's perspective. Unemployment was low good supply of permanent jobs, unions, uh, higher rates of unionization, and they secured good wages, uh, good benefits packages, pensions, and then on top of that, there are loads of legislative changes, human rights legislations, employment insurance, uh, public health changes, and workplace uh, health regulations, which meant that it was actually 
pretty good to be a worker between 1945 and 1980. Well, really 1960 to 1980 was a real golden age. Um, on top of that, between 1960 and 1980, it was possible to have a middle class life on one income. On just one income, you could have a middle class life um, up to that time. And so really, it was um, a golden age era. And things have changed. Unemployment is rising. Has anybody heard the phrase superstar companies? Yeah? Now, a, a superstar company, from an economic perspective, is a company with very few people working there, but very, very high profits. And so a lot of the new gig economy uh, um, sort of companies are superstar companies, huge profits with very, very few people working, and that's what people are working towards. More precarious work, unionization has dropped. For everybody who's in the public service, unionization's gone up. Uh, but for people outside the public service, unionization has dropped precipitously over that period of time. Only 40% of people have pensions. And just to give you an idea of the social changes, which we don't always see, in uh, 1976, if you were unemployed, 90% of people who are unemployed got income assistance. Now in 2016, if you're unemployed, you have a 50-50 chance of getting employ, um, uh, income assistance. And these are the things that you don't see at the bottom end. Uh, but there are significant changes, uh, not only to the rates of poverty, but to low paid people. And then, of course, as you all know, the greatest share of the economic growth is going to people who own companies rather than to workers. So before 1980, uh, if your company made a 10% profit, about eight. Um, um, eight percent was going to be distributed to the workers. If you move that forward to about now, um, about half of that is going to the workers. And if you're a low paid worker, none of it is going to you. So that half is actually going to high paid workers. And so there's a gap, an increasing gap uh, between rich and poor. And in Ontario, they talk about an hourglass economy. Have you heard this phrase? The hourglass economy is you get more people at the top, the middle class is completely hollowed out, and then you have more people at the bottom. And that's how the shape of the economy is changing in, um, in Ontario. It's also changing if you're in work. Uh, this is from a study which is of um, uh, people who are employed. And when they looked at people who are employed in Ontario, 70% of people uh, were in full-time employment. But only 50% of those people who were in full-time employment had what's known as a standard employer employment relationship. And this is this concept where you're in a permanent job with one employer that you can reasonably expect to still be employed uh, over the next year, uh, and you have a benefits package. So that's used to be the standard employment relationship, and that is now not the standard employment relationship. And um, uh, if you are one of the uh, workers who is in a more precarious uh, work, uh, you're more likely to have your hours changed, um, you're less likely to have benefits, uh, and your pay is likely to change over time. Unfortunately, I like the phrase, the sharing the scraps economy, um, because it is actually more uh, indicative of what the sharing economy is. Uh, the sharing economy isn't really... In fact, I can't remember. If I, if I said to my brother, let's share this, only you pay me, yeah, I think he'd say that's not really sharing, okay? I think I'd say, well, how, do you, how do you get sharing out of that? Um, but that's really what the sharing economy is. Sharing economy is not sharing at all. Not only is it not sharing, um, it's got two or three purposes. Uh, one purpose is to allow people to sell things they have or sell, you know, whether it's an extra room they have or the fact that they've got a car and they can drive people about. Uh, the other thing is it allows um, big business to monetize uh, your stuff because 
they never really previously got any money from your spare room, but now uh, they get money from your spare room. And if you can do that all over the world, there are millions and millions and millions of spare rooms that were just sitting there, not bringing any money into, um, uh, uh, into uh, an app provider, but now they're making money out of it. But one of the other things that it does is it internationalizes um, uh, uh, an ability to circumvent um, employee protections. And so it produces a huge unprotected workforce that allows, uh, uh, allows big business to, to make money. And so uh, as a, a way of undermining employee standards, it's a great tool uh, and um, makes it sound like having followed the saying, if I were Donald Trump, and then saying undermining employee stand, employment standards is a good thing. I, I think I'm going in the wrong direction here. Um, last, 47%, and this is the AI, of US jobs are susceptible to automation. Now, it's not saying they will be automate, automated, but they are susceptible for automation. And so we've hit this, um, what some people could say is a perfect storm. Increased poverty, increased inequality, less secure work, increasing unemployment, less tax buffering from poverty, a smaller safety net, few pensions, and fewer benefits, and the likelihood of significant um, um, retraining. Did, did, has somebody got, is that a, an actual train? <laughs> <laughs> that, is, this, is this your... Yeah, it, as, as, um, uh, as, as ringtones go, that's not the most embarrassing I've seen. Um, anyway. Here's one way of thinking about it. And this is what it feels like in, uh, in, uh, in Toronto. And I'll, I'll carry on with this sort of storm analogy or see. Most people in Toronto and Ontario, it feels like, are on sort of a luxury cute cruise. Loads of entertainment, all the food they want, uh, just basically having a good time. But there's a significant proportion of the population, maybe a third of the population, who are actually in the sea, and they're treading water. Okay? And if they stop treading water, they drown. If they continue to tread water, they will die younger because of the energy they use up. And if a big wave comes over, they're gone. And that's what's happening. And the idea of a basic income was simply to put a platform under them and keep their head above water. That's all it was. It wasn't even to get them on the ship. The ship's going off into the distance, but it was just to make sure that the impacts of poverty and inequality you know, didn't lead to premature death. That, that's the only thing that it was really trying to do from a health perspective, from a social perspective, apart from it just being the right thing to do in a high-income country. It also has a huge number of economic and social benefits that you might imagine. And that's why it's not new. They had this worry in the 60s. Uh, in the 60s, when they were reforming work, when there was higher unionization, they were still worried that there were too many people who were poor. And just in North America in the 60s, between 68 and 75, there were five basic income studies, four in the USA, one in Canada. The Canada was the um, uh, Mincom study, and that was a negative tax uh, relief study again. Um, there were about 10,000 people in these studies over that time. Uh, four of them were randomized controlled trials, and one of them was a saturation site, which was a Canadian. And just some of the worries that people have in basic income is that if you give people money, uh, they'll stop working and they'll just get lazy. That's one of the big things that, 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 that people <laughs> say. And it was interesting, if you look at all of those studies, Young men reduced their hours, generally to go back to school. But the hours, the amount of hours people reduced their work was 1% to 8%. Yeah. But it was 1% to 8% invested. 
back in these studies, and most of these studies, remember, were being done when you only needed one income to be a middle-class family. And so women were working much less. Uh, women decreased their working significantly more as a percentage, but the actual hours that were decreased were, were slightly more, but not as much as you think. Uh, but that was for caring. And so it was either caring for parents or caring for kids. But, I mean, people, again, were using their time positively. Um, Netflix didn't exist. No one was spending their time uh, sort of going through uh, uh, back episodes of Broadchurch or whatever your uh, particular passion is. Uh, people were doing things with their time. They were stopping work to do things. Um, and stopping work or decreasing work uh, and decreasing the tension in households due to these uh, uh, basic income uh, seemed to improve the education of children in every study, uh, whether it's through test scores or through high school completion, it made a difference. And uh, the study in Manitoba showed increased health, decreased hospital admissions, decreased accidents, decreased visits to family doctor, and decreased um, uh, visits to mental health professionals. So all in all, um, back to my Donald Trump, basic income, good. Okay, so what were we doing in Ontario? So, Ontario, 2016, Liberal government uh, decided that um, it was worth having a look at the basic income. Um, and uh, the Minister of Finance launched this in the budget in 2016, uh, really standing on the back of everything that had happened before. They wanted to test a growing view at home and abroad that a basic income could build on the success, and then they can't help themselves, of minimum wage policies. They just said they were going to increase the minimum wage, and increases in child benefit, which they'd had already done, to provide a more consistent and predictable support in the context of today's labor market. And the first thing they did is they got Hugh Siegel, who was a, a conservative senator and who had been interested in the basic income since the 70s, uh, to uh, write a discussion paper. And he, because uh, he's a policy guy, um, obviously started off by congratulating the government um, progress on old age security, child poverty decreasing, though it hasn't that much, uh, free student tuition and stuff, everything's going good, but we haven't been able to change the rate of poverty from about 16%. So we need to do something different. And what's uh, different could be a basic income. And the basic income, he said, could, needs to do some things. We've got this horribly bureaucratic welfare program that could change. It's not nimble for people to come in and out of work. And it uh, undermines people's dignity. Um, it's off-putting, it's discouraging. You have to keep on showing that you're poor or you can't work in order to continue to get um, uh, the um, uh, uh, money. And those who've already got, who've built up savings get penalized. On top of that, there are millions and millions of dollars in Ontario which is spent on policing poverty, to making sure you're really poor, and therefore you, do, you deserve uh, to get the money. And he's saying the basic income could help by refocusing things. We could think about uh, protection of human di dignity and if, uh, rather than just thinking of efficiency. We could think about supporting families and therefore improving child development. Uh, and we could think about the fact that currently we do a huge amount of tax reduction, reducing and tax transfers, but they only go to people who've got RRSPs or uh, TFSOs. And maybe we could give it to people who haven't got those, uh, you know, haven't got their own safety net. Maybe we could give tax transfers to people in poverty to bring them out of poverty rather than to people who are rich to keep them rich. Uh, and it's always great to see a conservative senator arguing that poverty damages life choices 
that if you get rid of poverty, it reduce, it's best for everybody's life, uh, and that uh, it costs a huge amount of money, and inequality is corrosive. Um, but he ended up saying that we actually don't know what would happen if we had a basic income in Ontario now. The previous studies were 40 years ago, and things had changed. So what would happen if we did it now? So we needed the research. It then went off to consultation. So his report went to consultation. Thousands of people were involved. You could do it online. There were public sessions, and there were written submissions. And I was uh, ran the thought leaders table uh, to try and really discuss it and think it through. And the outcome was we decided to do a negative income tax. Uh, communities across Ontario, um, the level would be above the poverty level. It would be simple, uh, but we try and measure lots of different things. So we wanted to measure poverty reduction, employment, work, labor market, education, health, housing, crime, life choices, food insecurity, social inclusion, citizenship, and what happened to other benefits. And then we were trying to make sure whether we were going to have a saturation site. And the saturation site is you go into one area and you try and give the basic income to everybody who's eligible in that area. So what did we do? Uh, we actually did introduce uh, a guaranteed income. We called it the basic income, but it wasn't really the basic income. Uh, it increased, the, and the aim was to increase the uh, stability of uh, people's lives and reduce economic anxiety. And we thought it would help people meet their basic redu needs, reduce stress, uh, and be able to invest in themselves and their families uh, so that they would have more stable housing, mental health, and employment outcomes. Uh, so they were in a position to really be part of society and be lifted out of poverty. And, and that's what we were trying to do. So above the line in the dark blue is our theory of change, and below the line is just the outcomes that we were hoping uh, it would be simpler, it would be less intrusive, there'd be less barriers to getting into the workforce. We'd reduce poverty, increase food security, decrease stress and stigma, and that we would have better mental health, uh, less healthcare usage, that people would be able to look after themselves better, have more housing stability, education, and training. And so, in general, we'd produce a better quality of life, uh, and we'd get more people into the labor market, we'd decrease crime, and we would uh, basically um, try and make people's lives a little better. The level was simple, um, uh, 19,000 uh, for a single individual, which was 75% of the low income cutoff instead of 50. Um, that if you then went to work for every dollar you earned, uh, we took um, half of it, but you could carry on making money with uh, and not hit your tax until you hit 34,000. Uh, 32 to 34,000 depends how it worked. If you were disabled, you'd get a disability supplement of $500 a month. If you had drug benefits and dental benefits, you would keep them. They would not be taken away. And if you had child benefit, it wouldn't be taken away either. Uh, that you'd be eligible uh, if you were 18 to 65 uh, and you'd lived in your area for more than 12 months. Um, and you would be able to opt in or opt out as you like. And we were hoping for 4,000 people to be in pay and uh, 2,000 controls. And just to move, move to the sites, we had one site which was in Thunder Bay, which was in, uh, in further north in Ontario, and that was going to be 1,000 people in the study and 1,000 controls. And then we needed 1,000 people in um, Hamilton and Brantford, again, 1,000 people taking in who are being paid, 1,000 people in control. And then we had a saturation site, which was Lindsay. And uh, Lindsay's a um, semi-rural town of about 20,000 people. And there were about um, 2,500, maybe more like 2,200 people who were earning less than um, uh, $32,000. Uh, um, and we were aiming to get 
about 90% of them into the study. Which if any of you have tried to do big population studies, you'd know was crazy. Uh, totally crazy to go to somewhere and say, we're just going to get everybody who's eligible into this study. So we did that, uh, <laughs> actually. We launched in the summer of 2017. We did get 6,000 people plus in pay, I think 6,200, something like that. We did get about 80% of the people in Lindsay into the basic income, who were eligible into the basic income uh, pilot study. And um, everybody came round to my house. We popped, a, uh, you know, we popped the cork. Uh, everybody was really happy. And uh, we were <sighs> flying. Yeah. Uh, because at that time we were completely clear that um, all parties had been spoken to and all parties, NDP, Liberal and Conservative, all agreed that they were never going to shut down this uh, project and this project would continue for the full three years. Um, so as you know, in uh, September 2018, the project was cancelled. Um, and currently there's a judicial review about whether it's a lawful decision. And there's a class action lawsuit um, being uh, taken by the uh, people from Lindsay and I think also from people from Hamilton. And you can imagine if, you're, if you are in somewhere like Lindsay where just about everybody who's uh, low, uh, a low wage is in a study which increases their um, wages and increases their flexibility and ability to do things. It changes the whole town. And if you just take that away, that causes chaos. That's a real problem. And uh, that's what happened. Uh, at the moment, the decision is uh, that it ends on uh, March in March 2019, but no data is now being collected. Uh, the data sets have been sent back to the government, and there's no plans to use the data. So we don't really know exactly what happened, but I just wanted to finish um, with just pictures that were taken by somebody called Jessie Gollum, who is, uh, I think she's the director or certainly um, uh, uh, one of the people who is working in a, a group called Photographers Without Borders. And she looked up uh, basic income uh, uh, participants in Hamilton. And I'm just going to go through uh, 10 pictures uh, that she's taken, which are um, uh, from uh, 10 different participants, where they've written what uh, they, uh, what they um, uh, experienced. Uh, and I'll read it just in case it's difficult to read for some people. Uh, basic income helped me to move into safer and clean housing as well as finally to be able to buy Christmas and birthday presents for my children. Basic income alleviated my stress when my income wasn't enough to each month. I'm precariously employed, I'm a full-time student, and beginning, man uh, beginning manual therapist in my community. Basic income was helping me as a single parent to recover and rebuild myself as a professional uh, artisan after a business uh, closure, a serious injury uh, with no unemployment assistance benefits, uh, low wage employment. It was, the f the, it was my last lifeline of hope, security for a better future, uh, hope and security for a better future. When I was on the basic income, I had enough money to buy groceries and still have money left over. I didn't have enough money to survive on when I was on the Ontario Disability um, Security Support Payment, is it? Program, program, program thank you. Uh, it's good that people here know these better than me. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think, it, no, it is good, it is good. Uh, I just wanted to have enough money to afford food and have extra to save. Universal basic income 
has helped me to become an active volunteer, artist, and entrepreneur. It can do the same for you. Universal basic income, among many other benefits, has provided me with a chance uh, to get to work uh, from Hamilton to Ontario and cook um, and look for more work in Ontario in Toronto, uh, developing my business. Universal basic income has made it, in, it possible to afford a means of transportation to eat and to be able to study as a full-time student. Currently, I have 30 hours a week of unpaid placement. Uh, I'm a student uh, and trying to work part-time around that schedule. Before the universal basic income, I couldn't afford to travel to school, uh, stroke placement or work, as there's no planned public transportation in my area. The universal basic income has alleviated stress from my busy life. Please save the universal basic income. The basic income was assisting me to become financially stable, obtain an apartment, and move out of this motel room and cook. I was well on my way to finding an apartment where, could I, where I could find a sense of peace. Then Doug Ford's PC cancelled basic income. Glad not to be locked into a lease. Took vocation for the first time in years next summer. Who knows? I pay my taxes too. Basic income gave me the first opportunity in my 25 years of survival to be able to lift myself out of poverty. Universal basic income helped me to catch up on pills. Not live paycheck to paycheck and get my husband in and to get my husband into recovery. It has also helped me pay for yearly shots for my animals and their ongoing health care. Basic income helps me stay healthy with good food. I am ill. The universal basic income has made it possible for me to return to school for social work so I can give back to my community. Um, sometimes I just wanted to end there because sometimes uh, when we're in policy and we're talking with uh, uh, big numbers and um, sort of big theories, uh, we forget that uh, this is, these are real people, uh, not statistics. And so I just wanted to end on the voices of some real people who went through um, what we thought was an experiment would change their lives, and it looks like it did for a bit, um, but, it, but when it's cancelled, that clearly leads to devastation. And there are many more pictures, and you can go on and on looking at uh, what uh, changes were made so that, you know, so that we sort of know that we were doing some good, or we think we were doing some good. Um, but uh, it's changed. And if you did want to see more, just uh, put in Google humans of the basic income and Jesse Gollum's pictures will come up. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I can talk more about the health impacts. I can talk more about the social impacts. But I wanted to spend this time giving a broad brush of what we did and why we did it and uh, start a conversation about um, you know, why it was needed. Uh, and then sort of move into the conversation where if you have uh, more detailed questions or things that have been uh, missed, uh, I'd be um, happy to try and help. So thank you very much. The images, yeah, the images make people cry. Request makes it sound like I'm going to sing. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. You're, 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 you're safe. You don't have to hear that. One question. Just to make sure I heard right, uh, the, right now the program looks like it's going to end in March of 2019. But did you say that they're not collecting data? Yeah. So what happened was the government decided that they were going to close the basic income um, project. Initially, the idea was, and this was in September, the, initially the idea was 
maybe it would close in September or October, uh, but they were persuaded that people needed to have more time, and so it's going to go on to the end of the financial year and will end at the end of March. Uh, but I understand from the researchers uh, that they're not collecting any data and the data sets have been sent to the government. Because their funding has been cancelled. The basic income is continuing, but the funding for the researchers? The payments continuing? are continuing, that's my understanding, uh, but um, nothing else is continuing in the same way. Do I understand that so if, if someone is working, the basic income would up? We get them up to $33,000, is that how? Yeah, so it's a negative tax credit. So to go into the study, you have to say, you know, preferably, but this is not usually what happened, you would show your previous year's tax return. And um, if you were earning, say, for instance, uh, 18000 in the previous year, then there would, you would get a percentage of the basic income. Yeah, but if you're earning 32, you wouldn't get anything. And so that's, that's how it works out. It's a sort of a graduated uh, scheme. You had a slide kind of early on that said, I think it was back maybe in the last century. Um, <laughs> um, Technically, yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, that... Uh, uh, participation in like unemployment insurance or something was 90% and in 2016 it was 50%. Could you yeah. comment a little bit more? Before? Yeah, so if you were unemployed, um, say for instance in the, um, uh, and it was last century, so it was in the sort of 80s and 90s of, uh, of the last century, um, um, then 90% of people who are unemployed would get uh, employee assistance. But in about the sort of between the sort of 90s, and, well, in the 90s, employee assistance rules changed. And because of that change, fewer people are eligible for employee assistance. So now only 50% of people who are unemployed actually are eligible to receive employee assistance because the rules changed significantly um, over the 90s. And so that's, that's why that's why that there's been a significant change in um, uh, what happens to people who are lower paid. My name's Logan Lawrence, I'm in the PhD Health Program. And I'm wondering from a policy perspective, there was a lot of time that went into developing this project and then it had its life cut short. If there is another change of government and a future government does want to take this up or a government in another Canadian jurisdiction wants to take it up, how much of what's been done is transferable to a new context so that maybe this project has hope sometime in the near future? Oh, most of it's transferable. I mean, um, it, it, as, as it's not really, how can I put it? it, it's not that difficult to do this. Uh, the main issue is political will and um, getting all your ducks in a row, right? It's. Uh, but most of the learnings about what you do and what you don't do, uh, how you reach people, if it's a project, um, you know, initially it was very difficult to convince anybody to be in a basic income project. Because most people, they think if it's too good to be true, it's not real. Yeah? And free money isn't, I mean, you don't give people free money. And so... Um, you know, there are ways of getting people into the studies, there are ways of keeping people in. We, there are ways of, um, um, of running the study so that it works for people and so it's not punitive. And all of those things are transferable. I am not allowed to talk about them because all of those things happen, all of that information would be things that I would know from uh, the time when I was um, an advisor and and we're not supposed to talk about that. But, um, um, but yeah, there's loads of transferable knowledge. And it was all captured. So we spent a lot of time making sure that all of the decisions that were made and why were captured. So all of that information is there and is, you know, in theory, could be mined by other people. 
So you could do a SWOT analysis of that. Of? Dot the data you capture. I, I would imagine so, yes. Opportunities and threats. I mean, yes, it would yes. be a very valuable. Oh, yes, it could happen. Um, yeah, you don't, all, you'd, all you'd have to do is get it out of the Ontario government that cancelled it. During, during the... That would take uh, a few years, and then yeah, you'd say, information... Yes, I say, yeah, during... It's yours. Yeah, during, during a um, uh, um, uh, sort of two court cases, so... It wasn't yeah. my question, but... Okay. I had a couple of questions. You said perfect storm, 35% treading water. Did you mention... Is that what I heard you say? Hmm. Depends how you look at it. If you look at it as the number of... Um, if you look at, sort of, you say, well, 16% of people are in poverty, poverty, and then you look at the number of people who are two or three paychecks away from going into poverty, you get to 30% really quite quickly. Okay, okay the next question was, um, or is, judicial review, class action lawsuits, what, is there legislation in place that you can hang either of those on? To, to bring, to bring, bring this back. Like, is there? How will you go about the judicial review? Is there something? So, was the law that you created, or was it populist decision making that brought about the basic income? Um, it's a good question. I don't know. Now, um, though I don't know, obviously it went through the legislature. Yeah, and so there was, um, both in 2016, um, there was, I think there was an act, and uh, then in 2017, obviously, it was in the budget. Uh, but then on top of that, um, the question would be whether you can actually cancel something like this that's gone through a, um, a research ethics board and uh, how that works and what the relationship may be between government and the Research Ethics Board or, uh, and, you know, are they really governed by Research Ethics Board if they get uh, Research Ethics Board approval uh, and you uh, cancel uh, the study. And then the uh, class action lawsuit uh, would be because people believe that they signed, um, they signed ethics, they signed uh, consent forms uh, which said that they'd get two or three years of money. And then it was cut short. So they would argue uh, probably that uh, there was a, they had a deal and a contract um, with the government and that's been broken. And so I think those are the areas that people are contesting uh, at the moment. But um, you would have to speak to the uh, government lawyers on that and... No, I'm not. A, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Right. Sorry. No. Uh, Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. That was, that was wonderful. Um, so I'm thinking about this from the point of view of you know when do we know enough to act to make a policy decision? And you mentioned <coughs> that when the pilot was coming about, what we knew was somewhat dated, and so things have changed, which you, you sort of illustrated in many ways. Um, therefore, the need to do a study. Again. Um, but in light of what happened politically, I'm wondering whether you're thinking back on that as a mistake or whether you'd entertain that as an idea. As in, you know, uh, we don't need more research to know that we should act. We don't know that it's going to work, but the inequality is plain. And so there's a, a set of policy reasons, whether it's from a point of view of justice or whatever, that suggest we should act and see what happens in real time, but we don't need to do the study first. Yeah, no. so, to approach it so you're talking about the, um, the difference between the real world and the political world. Yeah, so the real world is that it is plain as day that if you've got a whole bunch of people underneath the poverty level and you take them above the poverty level, that's probably good for their health, right? No brainer. Um, but you have to do it and you have to pay for it. And if you're going to pay for it, you're going to have to take the money from somewhere. So if we were going to say for Canada, um, the feds decided, uh, they did a paper last year which came out and said that if there was a basic income on the Ontario model for the whole of Canada, that that would cost the feds probably about 70, $75 billion, okay? So 
where would you get $75 billion? Well, TFSAs, um, uh, RRSPs, and other tax transfers, that's $120 billion, right? So um, you're likely to start looking at that, which means that you're going to have um, possibly an issue with the electorate, okay? So if you're trying to do it locally, you would probably go for an incremental approach of building ahead of steam, uh, linking to other international projects, softening up the ideas around basic income, and then turning around and saying, look, your biggest fear is that people wouldn't work. People not only worked, they improved. Your biggest fear is this would be incredibly expensive. It didn't happen. Your biggest fear is everybody spent, would spend it on pot. That didn't happen, right? Um, and you'd need politically probably to do that in order to get to the next stage, unless you were very early in your term. Yeah, if you were doing it in the first year of your term, you got year, you've got three or four years to, to, to deal with the fallout. But if you're doing it towards the end of your term, right, it's a problem. Uh, you, so yeah, so they had to, they believed politically, they wanted to do it, and they wanted to start small and then move on. You or I would have just said do it, probably. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So this, this person who lives better than the woman with the white turtle? Who is the person? Oh, right. hey. Hi. Yeah. How are you? I'm Jeff, and I was at the legislature in the last city in Nova Scotia here, and since you all live, you know, you're all students and you, you live here, you know, you, you can vote next time. But anyways, they, and so I'm not, you know, this is something I'll have to find out. I didn't know I was coming here until I saw the road was over half an hour before I off the bus. So I didn't get the background information of the date that, that the legislature last sat. But it's, um, I had pretty much unanimous consent to do a study of you know, what basic income would be in you know, Nova Scotia. And so I gotta go, you know, and you can, you can, you can watch the Nova Scotia legislature on your computer, you know, and so you can actually physically see these people. And you know, the one guy that mumbled something under his breath, I actually saw him later and asked him, what did you say? And he was a good mm -hmm. but, but, you know, like there is, there is hope in Nova Scotia for this. And our Halifax member of parliament, Amy Fillmore, you know, is, you know, we're, 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 we're needling and working on it. You know, so, so it's a matter of political will, but they don't do things that you don't ask for. And so, you know, as, as great as it is to understand all this, if we don't daily, you know, these people. Nothing's going to change. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, all over the world, people are saying that um, things have to change because of the trends that there are in um, everywhere. So I'm not surprised Nova Scotia is interested. Uh, but also because, um, you know, the titans of industry uh, are all saying the same thing, which is, you know, we need a basic income uh, pilot. Um, it was interesting in Ontario that industry were some of the biggest allies. Uh, industry were, were in some ways bigger allies uh, than um, sort of uh, some parts of the NDP. So, um, yeah, industry is very much interested in the basic income, and we can, it's, it's, you're saying, of course they are. <laughs> Yes. The question they don't have to pay, right? Well, that's a separate issue. There's a question about whether um, whether they would pay. Yeah, and uh, you know they have all these sorts of things. There's this uh, idea of a robot tax. Have you come across that? Yeah, and there are loads of other ideas about what you do with automation because in the end people do have to live, uh, and there needs to be enough money to to uh, allow the system to work. So. Um, you can't really get 45% unemployment without uh, things going drastically wrong. So you have to think of how it's going to work. Yes, uh, just 
point of clarification, I didn't catch, um, back on that slide where you're talking about scraps, and you're talking about people using their cars and their homes to earn a bit of extra income. I think you said that enriched the big business, and I didn't follow how that Okay, happened. so if you are um, uh, um, Google, yeah, I think, uh, I believe Google gave $315 million uh, for Uber when Uber was having a difficulty, okay? And you'd say, well, why would they do that? Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons they would do it is because you're always looking for things to monetize that you haven't been able to monetize. And the idea of being able to monetize people's spare time, um, which is what happens in Uber, uh, they just take 15% of it, is, is an amazing opportunity for business. And so similarly with um, uh, uh, not just the ride sharing, but um, um, I keep on forgetting. Sorry? Airbnb and things like that. Uh, that is a way of producing money for bigger business where it never used to exist. And not just in one country, all over the world. And then you can decrease your regulation. So one of the things that happened in Ontario was that um, Uber said it was impractical for Uber drivers to um, uh, have to take a, safe, a, a driving safety test. It's just impossible. And uh, the legislature caved on that. Then the taxi drivers said, well, just a second, if they're not taking a safety test, we're not taking a safety test. And so the legislature caved on that and slowly sort of protections start uh, going. And as the price goes down, then the companies, the taxi companies say, well, just a second, we can't afford anything that looks like uh, this sort of insurance. Insure yourselves, right? We can't afford you know, to um, pay you benefits. I mean, that's your problem. And you start deregulating the, uh, the workforce. And deregulated in workforce would drive down costs of workforce and increase profitability. And so it's all, you know, anything you can do to get an extra margin on the profitability increases your profits. And that's sort of where things are going. And that's how you get more money going to owners of companies and less money going to workers. Because as the more you can deregulate and internationalize your workforce, the easier it is to pay off different parties against each other and drive down uh, quality of the, of, of the of, uh, sort of working life. And quality of working life is cost, right? So that's the... It's, 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 it's not... It, you know, it's business, it's pretty straightforward stuff. You know. Thanks. Sheila? That was really good. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, sure. Yes, of that. course. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was, it was such, such an important uh, talk. And uh, I, I was especially going to laugh at that metaphor that you gave us at the luxury cruise over the folks living on with the rise of trending water. It was really uh, a neat way of thinking about it. One of the, one of the things that you brought out just a minute ago in your comments that gives me hope for the basic income is the kind of the, um, the aligning of interests among folks uh, who identify as conservatives, so Hugh Siegel on the one side and, you know, Kim Pate, another senator on the other side, both advocating for a, a basic income. But it also gives me some reason, as someone else just suggested, to be a little bit sus suspicious or concerned. And, and so I wonder if you might de develop a little bit um, your uh, analysis of sort of why it is the titans of industry, as you call them, have some of them have come out in support, and then second, I guess, are there approaches to the basic income or sort of models, uh, some of which are sort of more responsive to income inequality than others, or is that is not you know, is, is that not the right sort of question? Okay, so I'm a psychiatrist, so I can tell you the paranoid position. Um, uh, <laughs> Would be, <laughs> would be that uh, the titans of industry are, uh, are interested in this because that means that they don't have to pay their workforce reasonable amounts of money and that they can do much more 
sort of precarious part-time work and they don't have that on their conscience because society in general looks after and that's fine and they can just carry on making their money. Uh, but just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean you're wrong. Um, uh, it could be that, uh, and you know, yeah, I mean, industry is there and they try and make money. One way of making money is uh, the short term uh, sort of uh, balancing the amount of money you make uh, to your costs. That's one way of doing it. Another way is to take a much more long term view about making sure that there's stability in uh, either a market or an area so you can grind out costs over a period of time. And uh, there are going to be people in industry who are interested in a cost reduction and pay reduction, and then there are going to be others who say, yeah, but if that, leads to a, if that leads to a revolution, this is a bad thing, right? We need much more stability. Uh, then there are other people who will say, but if everybody has enough money, then we have uh, you know, people who are going to buy things. And if only a few people have enough money, eventually we're not going to be able to make enough money out of them. Yeah. Uh, because richer people save more than they spend, and poorer people spend everything they have. Okay, And so it's actually easier to make money if you can lift everybody up to a certain level, you can be stable over a period of time, uh, and you can make your money. Uh, so I think there are going to be people in business who are sort of uh, type 1 people, they're not caring about society at all, they just want to make money and get out of there. Uh, and there are going to be other people who say, this doesn't work in the long term. And it works badly in the long term. And so we have to actually make things work in some ways for us. So I think there's, there's that that is, is an issue. Um, but part of that issue is in how you pay for it. Because if you pay for it by taking the profits or taking a percentage of the profits of the people who are making all of the money... Um, then it's, it's less of an issue. Um, and the question is whether we have a political system that allows that to happen in any sort of uh, reasonable way. So there is um, a, a worry that um, this is a bad thing. Um, and I would share that worry as well as uh, a fact that, that it depends how we do it. Um, and it does depend. There's no particular good reason. I mean, you, you have to think of how much you tax income compared to how much you tax wealth. And if you move to taxing wealth rather than income, you get to a different place. Yeah. Uh, it is, um, uh, and just to show how stark it is in the States, uh, you know who the Waltons are? Yeah. Sorry? Not Jim Bob. Yeah, Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so you take those seven, seven, Walter, seven of the Waltons, and you put them in a car. Uh, their wealth is the same as 120 million of the poorest Americans. Okay? Um, but uh, about 20% of people who work in Walmart are on benefits. Okay? So those 120 million people are actually subsidizing. Um, uh, the sort of how um, the, uh, the uh, Waltons make their money. And so somebody could say, well, you know, that's not reasonable. Yeah, It can't just be on sort of your, your earnings and the amount you're earning each year. It's got to be about how you're amassing wealth because this doesn't make any sense, right? And what are you doing with that money anyway? It's not helping the economy. And some people might say that that is a way of thinking about how you fund the basic income. Uh, and that, some people would be attracted to that because the idea of going after uh, TFSAs and RRSPs is probably going to shrink the middle class even further, uh, and that, that would be a problem. Yeah, we've kind of moved on from this point, but I just wanted to add the concern about this so-called sharing economy. I certainly know more about Airbnb than Uber, but Airbnb is a U.S. company with value of more than $40 billion U.S. and doesn't pay a cent of tax in Canada, so there's thousands of hosts in Canada. Oh, yeah. Millions of them. Yeah. And um, there's Airbnb, there's that. Um, uh, Amazon was doing that in the U.K. for years. 
pay no tax at all. Uh, and uh, you know, I think there are there are issues around how 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 that is working. Um, Airbnb were taken to court because, or somebody tried to take Airbnb to court because if you uh, look at um, the same um, accommodation uh, owned by somebody who's uh, African American and somebody who is uh, white American in New York, there's a differential price, a significant differential price, probably 50%. Okay, so somebody, oh yeah. So somebody said to Airbnb, hey, well, yeah, well, just a second, <laughs> you know, this is clear sort of discriminatory, you know, practice here. And Airbnb's position was, uh, and this is uh, what I'm, uh, you know, uh, what read uh, and reported, um, we're an app. It's not, yeah, we're just an app. Yeah, yeah, it's not, nothing to do with us, but just an app. Sure, that we do, and that might be our last question after the same. Hey, uh, you touched on it earlier, but the way to pay for it, like taking the tax transfers away from RSV to TLA, um, how do you um, sell the idea of universal basic income to, say, a suburban area in Toronto? Like, how do you change like what the ethical standard is for society from electing another Ford to? Getting them to accept the universal basic income is actually better for them and their children than the status quo today. I think that's a good question. Uh, and do you have any other good questions? Because <laughs> I, I can't answer that one. <laughs> I really can't answer that one. It's 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 the there are one there are a couple of there are a few assumptions. I didn't say you had to. I was just saying that that's where people might look. They might look at TFSAs. They may look at um, uh, they may look at RSPs. And uh, the reason why we moved on to looking at wealth rather than anything else was there are other ways of doing it. Uh, so I think people would have to try and work out how to do that. But I mean, really, um, sort of, if you do the math, uh, they say about 70 uh, billion, uh, $75 billion it would cost. Poverty costs $38 billion. Okay, so if you're actually raising people out of poverty, the differential doesn't come to the 70, the differential comes more like 40. And then the question is, where can you find $40 billion? And um, I would argue that between provinces and the feds, $40 billion a year uh, in order to pr improve health is um, not a problem. Uh, and that if it does produce the economic improvements that it could, the thing could pay for itself. Um, so it, it, it may be that you don't need to, um, uh, uh, to sort of go to TFSAs and RRSPs. It's just where people all often look at when they say, hey, well, look, these people are getting uh, tax benefits already. These people aren't. Why don't we swap them around? I think there are other ways of doing it. I was more trying to ask them how do you change somebody's mind from... I know. I didn't answer that. Because okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's a good segue, obviously, to the comment you made about the 38 million cost. And I was just wondering, the data that was going to be collected, to what extent would it help quantify where those savings would be in other social programs, whether it's health under yeah, the data that was collected would have looked at efficiencies of uh, actually giving out benefits because half the people in the study were um, people who were on benefits and half were not. And so there would be enough data to be looking at uh, the cost of benefits. Then, yes, um, for the saturation site, where <coughs> the economic benefits were going to be measured compared to other similar um, other similar uh, uh, towns, so similar to Lindsay, and so you could see whether there are significant economic benefits and where and how. And so there was an in-depth costing, not only of, of sort of cost to government, but possible benefits to, co uh, to government that was going to be undertaken. Just a, a broader question in terms of uh, battling poverty. Is this the only thing you need? If you could do this across the country, or are there elements in that population that would need more 
to uh, thrive or have a chance to thrive? I think that given the situation that we have, that it's very unlikely that um, a universal basic income by itself would be sufficient. And one of the reasons why people didn't have their dental or disability benefits uh, taken away is because other things are needed. Um, it's not clear that a universal basic income would allow you uh, not to uh, look at uh, historical inequities that have led to uh, intergenerational problems. Um, it wouldn't necessarily wipe out racism. Uh, I say necessarily, it wouldn't actually wipe out racism. Um, um, but uh, And it wouldn't deal with uh, mental health and drug problems. It would decrease all of those things, but it doesn't give... It wouldn't be an excuse for getting rid of all government uh, assistance programs or targeted uh, programs to uh, improve uh, uh, social development uh, or health or public health. It, it's just an aid. It decreases the rate of. It doesn't get rid of uh, everything. It's not a panacea. I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking Dr. McKenzie.